I was just watching Call the Midwife, so if you can see remnants of crying, that's why. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever watched a single episode of that show and not like sobbed uncontrollably. They really know how to pull at the heartstrings. I love that show so much. I love it so much that when I finished my master's program and I was kind of just like in between jobs and trying to figure out what kind of career I wanted, I seriously considered going back <laughs> and becoming a midwife with, a, with no qualifications. I did not do any sciences in school. Um, I have no reason to be a midwife <laughs> other than I loved that show and I, <laughs> I wanted to like live a real life version of it. Sometimes I think my goal is my hair to be like Stalker Channing in The Good Wife. Hello bibliophiles, my name is Jill and it's a freezing cold snowy day here in the end of January. <sighs> the longest month. I feel like this month never ends. And I always forget that January feels like the longest month of the year until I'm in it. And I always get to kind of like the last week of January and I'm like really miserable. I don't know why. It's because we're still in January. But we're here to do a January wrap up. However, before we go into my January wrap up, I realized I did not wrap up my December books from last year. And I know nobody cares anymore. And like nobody's even noticed probably. But for me, I just like need to like, I feel like I need to close a chapter on the year, just like speak, speak my truth into the universe and then we can be done. So I'm going to give a one sentence review of all the books I read in December, there's only six. So the first two books I want to talk about are the Murderbot series, book one and book two called, I don't know what they're called, Artificial Condition is one of them, and All Systems Read by Martha Wells. Um, I liked them both a whole lot, liked the first one better than the second one. That's my review. <laughs> Next, I read a poetry collection called Silver Tongue by Rebecca Salazar. I liked that a whole lot. <laughs> I should do all wrap-ups like this. <laughs> Same to all, like 20 minutes of your day. I read a book called The Pachinko Parlor by, I can't remember the name of the author or the name of the translator. I liked that book as well. My only real criticism of that book is that the relationship between the main character or the narrator of the book and this young girl that she's teaching French to is very underdeveloped and it should have been longer. I also read Sorrow and Bliss by Megan Mason. I listened to an audiobook and I thought the audiobook was really well done. I really liked this book. Uh, I was afraid before going into this book because I am someone who has struggled with, you know, anxiety and depression in the past. I was afraid this would kind of like upset or trigger me and it did not do that at all. I thought it was really well represented. A mental illness. I thought it was an excellent read and it made me cry. I really enjoyed it so I recommend that one. The last book and the book I probably have the most to say about is The Other Mother by Rachel M. Harper and it's a book that I thought for sure I would give five stars because many people who I have similar reading tastes to gave it five stars and I didn't. I probably gave it like three and a half. I loved the plot of this book. I liked the characters in this book. I thought the characters were very well developed all around, really interesting. I thought the plot was really good and I'm not normally like a plot type of person. Um, it's, it's not by any means like a really dramatic story, but like I thought the, the, the what's it called, the hit points of the plot were really good, the pacing points, what's, what is the word? You know what I'm trying to say? The kind of key moments of the plot were really well handled. I like that it was told from different perspectives. I thought the writing was beyond overdone, really like pushing the limits sometimes of just like bearable, really cheesy in some points, really overwritten. It wasn't the case for the whole book. I thought lots of it was really easy to read and nicely written and stuff, but some parts were just so like painfully like you could tell that she was trying so hard to infuse so much like metaphor simile emotion like meaning into what she was saying and it just felt like I was being hit over the head with like rudimentary <laughs> writing tools and I just I didn't like parts of it so that's why it sits kind of on the higher middle of the road for me that is December done and dusted you're welcome Oh, I made two coffees today and they're both disgusting. Maybe this oat milk isn't very good. <laughs> anyway, this is disappointing. It's really gross. I can't, mm. I love wearing black when I'm filming videos. I just think it's like uh, the best color to show up against my lipstick that I'm wearing and also the books I'm holding up. But you can see every single cat hair, every piece of dust, every piece of hair that falls off of my head. So, you know, I try to get it off, but what can I do? I just... When you live with a cat, there's just no way you can do anything about it. Like, this is a life that I've chosen and <laughs> I must live with it. Let's talk about my January reading. I had a rough start to this reading year and I think it's because of the book I chose. Obviously, I mean, 100% that's why. I had a rough start to this reading year. The first book I read and completed was Matthew Perry's biography called Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing. I think it's what it's called. My sister gave it to me for Christmas, which I'm grateful for because I did, I was curious about it. I had only heard kind of bad things, but I was still really curious about it. My sister also wanted to read the book, so I decided to read it as quickly as I could while I was still, um, you know, at home in Newfoundland, and so then I gave it to her, which is why I read it so quickly. I probably wouldn't have gotten to it right away, 
but I'm glad I read it and I'm glad I got it, <laughs> got, it, got it off my like shelf because it's bad guys. It's a <laughs> it's a really bad memoir. The writing is, pre is pretty bad in the sense that it feels like you're reading Chandler speaking which doesn't work on a page. It works of course as a character in a show that's 30 minutes. It doesn't work a 250 page book. It's annoying and it's childish. I didn't like it at all. Matthew Perry is mean. Like he's I, I like he comes across as someone who is inherently very jaded and like uh, like angry at the world but like knows he has no right to be so he's like trying to like soften the blow by the, of the mean things he says by kind of couching and saying oh I'm so sorry I was so bad to you, these people or whatever but I just didn't respect him at all after reading this book. I do have a lot of empathy for him because obviously he's had a long hard journey with addiction and it sounds like he has really been through the ringer and it's hard and it doesn't sound enjoyable at all and it sounds like he's really struggled. So I am empathetic to that side of the story but the way he writes about it is not nice or enjoyable or like I don't know why he wrote, he wrote this book for money like 100% that's why he wrote this book because there's nothing in it for fans of Friends. He doesn't really go into any detail about the backstory of what it was like to work on Friends. He talks about how lucky he felt to be on set but he doesn't talk at all about like you know behind the scenes stories or he has like maybe two in a whole book which is like if you're a Friends fan what you want is that kind of behind the scenes like that's what you want to get from this book. He doesn't give any. It's not at all rewarding for a Friends fan. It is by and large a long list of celebrities that he has either hung out with, worked with and like ruined his relationship with them because of his addiction or because of just the way he is and a long list of women that he has slept with, dated, broken their hearts, been really awful to and him apologizing. And it just feels like this is a book that could have been a series of letters of apology. The whole time I just felt like who is the audience of this book? He says he wrote it for other addicts to show that there's like hope but it's not a hopeful book. He spends the whole time talking about how hard everything is for him always even though he has all the supports that a human being can have. And he also makes a comment at the very beginning so the whole book opens basically with the fact that he he has a very traumatic uh, medical episode where his bowel basically explodes and he almost dies. So after the doctors save his life <laughs> he says that there was like a hole or a leak or something in his body and the doctors couldn't find where this was so he had to go on this diet where he couldn't eat or drink or like it sounds really horrible actually but basically that he couldn't consume anything until they found out where this leak was so they didn't die of sepsis basically and then they, when they find it like it takes them a long time to find it and when they do it's like near where the um eruption happened or the whatever in his bowel and he's like he makes a kind of sarcastic comment about like why did they look there first like obviously that's where, that's where it would have been because that's where like the initial kind of site of injury was it's like do you think they didn't try Matthew like <laughs> It just seems so bananas. Like he talks about how good his medical care is and then he slags off the medical care in the same paragraph. It's just bananas to me. Don't read this book. It is not good. <laughs> and then I read and you know I read this book. You know I had to read this book. Me and you know a million other people <laughs> bought and read Spare by Prince Harry. Isn't it so funny to say that Prince Harry is the author of a book? I read Spare by Prince Harry. I honestly don't have much to say about this book that hasn't already been said by everybody else on the internet. I've seen such mixed things about the writing. I think the writing is like pretty mediocre. It's better than Matthew Perry's book in the sense of it doesn't feel as it doesn't feel malicious or like he has a bone to pick. Honestly it feels pretty vulnerable. Obviously he's not he has a ghostwriter he didn't write this book but I think they captured a certain tone that I think is effective in this book. Is it like a beautifully written memoir? No. Um, is it written kind of like stream of conscious? Yeah. My favorite review of this book is Lena Norm's video. I'm gonna link it above and below because I think she has such a good take on this book. Her review really captures I think things I missed and she has a lot of cultural context I think is that's really important for understanding what's happening in this book. He kind of talks at the end of this book about how it's like enforced infantilization in some ways how he's like not allowed to learn how to do things. He's not allowed to have a job. He's not allowed to take care of himself, his finances because that's not what the monarchy does. He's like forced to rely upon a system that he has no desire or choice to be a part of. In terms of like should you or should you not read this memoir, you know if you want to read this memoir or not. All the kind of sensational things you've already seen online probably, they all kind of happen in here. They were kind of less interesting to me than like other things that he kind of talks about. The In the middle of this book he talks about his experience at war and like god bless you Harry, it's so boring. <laughs> <laughs> like thank you for your service sir but like so boring. Anyway I have nothing else to say about this book. <laughs> in addition to starting this month with kind of two not spectacular memoirs I also read another book that I felt kind of whatever about 
and it was of women in salt by Gar Gabrielle Garcia I think is her name this cover lit love it so beautiful I read this for my book club and I again I felt incredibly neutral about it to the point where I honestly don't remember a whole lot about it in some ways it should have really worked for me because it's a multi-generational family saga except the way that it's written it reads like a series of short stories interconnected um, but not linearly over time of this family and if you know my, my preference for short story collections I don't like short story collections where they all intersect so I feel like if this had been told linearly I might have liked it more. Other problem I had with it that really affected my feeling about it was that every single story felt every chapter about every person it was like I said in my book club it was like it felt like an issue and when I say that I meant like something big and like political political politically charged happened in every chapter so there would be a woman who was in a um an immigration detention center there'd be a child who was a child of rape there was a woman who was addicted to drugs uh there was a woman who was uh being abused by her husband and there's a couple of different things that happen like that but every single story has come some kind of like big political statement to make in a short chunk chapter and I just couldn't see anything but the fact that it was trying to make these political statements and not I disagree with them <laughs> and like not that I think that like it shouldn't have been told this way it's just that like it was so clear to me that that's what was happening but to me as I was reading it felt like the author wanted to talk about an issue and then wrote a story around an issue not wanting to tell a story and then the issue kind of arises from that story if that makes any sense. Anyway I thought it was fine, I thought it was okay, our book club really enjoyed it, um, I thought it was like not the worst book I've ever read but it certainly wasn't one that I loved. But luckily after a bit of a rough go uh, at the beginning of the month we had an upswing and I read some books I really enjoyed at the end of the month. The first I'll talk about is Trickster Drift by Trickster Drift by Eden Robinson. This was my TBR spin pick for January and I really enjoyed reading this. I do want to say there are some really massive like writing problems with this series and it happened in the first book too. This is like the second book in a series. It's almost like the book is so enjoyable that I'm more than willing to overlook that because I think the characters are really good and I think it's funny and I liked the setting and all these other things like it worked for me but like there are some strange decisions made <laughs> with the writing. Even though this is the second book in the series I almost feel like you could read it separate from the first book because it feels so contained in its own story and the threads from the first book are so tenuous at best that like I think you wouldn't you could read it and not even really pay attention to it and it wouldn't really matter except until the very end. So Jared is a 17 year old kid, uh, he's indigenous, his mother is a witch, uh, his father is a trickster and he is leaving his home in British Columbia to move to Vancouver to go to school and basically to get away from like a pretty toxic environment in a lot of different ways. He had a, in the first book something that I still don't really understand <laughs> happens to him and he's leaving to get away from it basically because he wants to like sober up feels like he's like lost control of his mind he's trying to like you know get on the straight and narrow. Moves to Vancouver, moves in with his aunt, uh, meets a bunch of cousins and friends from like um, his indigenous neighborhood and his like like all kind of family and stuff. All those characters are so good. I loved all relationships. I love the kind of community building, loved all that stuff. Um, he also can see ghosts and so there's like ghosts that he meets and, and kind of befriends or like kind of tolerates and I liked those characters as well. They're very like friendly, interesting, funny ghosts. So this whole book is basically just Jared living his life in Vancouver, uh, meeting his family, dealing with all that kind of like a lot of small time drama in this book. In the background there's some big drama happening which I won't spoil because it's part of the series but I will say the thing that is like insane <laughs> about this book is that Jared's only 17 years old. He grew up in a very kind of um, disruptive household. Like his mother was is not they have a strange relationship. She's not very motherly and she's not very kind to him either. He acts like an auntie. <laughs> like he cooks, he cleans, he's like very responsible, he like takes care of other people. Like he does not act like a 17 year old boy at all and I just find that so funny and like so unbelievable but also like I don't care because I love things that's happening around it. So yeah. I think this book is kind of bananas but also I just absolutely loved it. I wasn't intending on reading the third one this year but I loved this one so much like I just enjoyed reading it so much that I think maybe I will. I don't know. Uh, I've heard the third one is not as good but you know we gotta give it a try. Then I read a short story collection called Girls of a Certain Age by Maria Edelman. Edelman. Um, I have had my eye on this for a long time because so I just think the cover is really stunning and I love the back as well. What I really liked about this short story collection was that 
you could tell they were all written by the same person so they all had like a very similar type of feel vibe i hate the word vibe <laughs> all a certain, like a very similar craft to them but they had different voices so I, I really appreciate that when an author is able to kind of mix up their voice a bit to tell different stories as with every short story collection there's some i prefer more than others um my favorites in this collection were i will tell you only the good pets are for rich kids None of these will bring disaster, The Lunatic Report, and The Wayside. I thought this was really good. I really enjoyed it. I was drawn to it so much because of the cover. But once I finally picked it up and I was like, oh, I don't know, like people seem really mediocre on this. But again, I think it's one of these things where, you know, short stories are very much a person to person situation. And I really liked it. And I'd like to read something else from her in the future because I think that uh, her style just like agrees with me. And we luckily rounded out this month with two massive hits. Of course, I reread The Anthropocene Reviewed by John Green. I've listened to this in audiobook twice except no more than twice because I go back and listen to different chapters like multiple times because I just love them so much my favorite chapter in here is probably Old Lang Syne is that what's called or is it called we're here because we're here let me just check yeah Old Lang Syne is my favorite chapter and maybe also Googling Strangers two very like uh they're pretty raw chapters and talk a lot about his own personal life and the way that he ties them to like other cultural moments is I think really effective and powerful but I just love this book so much and I cannot recommend it more highly on audiobook. You get extra chapters in the audiobook as well, but also just like him reading it out. They're short, so like, you know, they're under, they're like 15 minutes or even less for each chapter. And so you can listen to them very quickly. And like, I'm not a John Green apologist. Like, I kind of gave up on him after I read The Fall in Our Stars. I just didn't like it very much. But this book is just really, it's swung back around. Like, I think he does such a fantastic job with this. He really deals with things, I think, that affect a lot of people that are both very personal and also very universal and I that's really effective and I just love this book it is so hopeful and it's healing and touching and I just I love it so much and also I finally read Mary Lawson's Crow Lake which is so so good this is a family story told in two timelines a woman from the present is kind of looking back on her past and telling about how her past affects her present the narrator's name is Kate and she has three siblings two older brothers named Matt and Luke who are like a decade older than her at least and then a younger sister who's like a baby and when she's seven years old her parents die in a car crash leaving her and her siblings alone to figure out what to do they live in this small town called crow lake or near crow lake which is i think i said around like now that i've read three of her books i think that she sets everything around this i don't know if it's a real town called struin or like a like that's kind of the hub that she connects these stories around so I gotta go back and like look at other books and kind of draw that connection. That's just, that's just me thinking out loud. Anyway, present day Kate is definitely emotionally stunted and <laughs> she has a new partner who is like lovely and she cares about him and through him the audience and eventually her come to understand how much her past affects her present still to this day. And so we spent a lot of this book in the past talking about like what happened after her parents died, what like the decisions her brothers made to take care of her and her sister, you know, what happened on the town kind of um she does this thing where which I actually love in books where she keeps hinting like about this thing that this kind of this turning point that happens in the book and she keeps hinting at it and she says well that was all before the turn you know this thing and she kind of she never really reveals it till the very end of the book and then that turning point comes into play at the very end of the book uh and it's really wrapped up very nicely and it kind of all comes together this beautiful little package at the end and I just really loved it. I love her writing. I love the setting. I think as a reader it's really easy to read something like this which does read so smoothly and easily and like is no effort at all to fly through the story and think like this is not beautiful writing or like excellent writing. But I think that this kind of story which is very quiet you know even though there is like dramatic things that happen like the death of her parents at the very beginning of the book this is at its core a story about four children who love each other, who are all grieving and trying to figure out how to like, in you know, in each different stages of their mental development, how to protect themselves, protect their family and to like, how to carry on. And that's the story here. And it, you know, and it also talks about how grief goes into the future and how, again, like not obviously like the death of a parent is a huge thing, but like, it doesn't affect the world. It just affects this family, you know? And it's a small contained story, both like in like location, but also just in characters. And it's just beautiful and it's, it feels really like close knit and it feels cozy. You can feel the tension, but you also feel the love. It's beautifully written. I just absolutely loved it. So those are all the books I read in 
December and January. Let me know if you've read any of these books. I'm sure you have read Spare <laughs> or some of you read, have read Spare or you've bought Spare and will read it eventually. I would love to know your favorite book that you read in January. As always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you soon. Bye!